Following the execution of Thomas More um, and the ascension of Sir Thomas Cromwell within the administration of King Henry VIII, uh, England was moved somewhat in a more Protestant turn, but the Church of England under Henry VIII remained rather Catholic in its belief and its liturgy. And as always with the Tudors, things remain dramatic and controversial. Sir Thomas Cromwell had replaced uh, Wolsey as the king's secretary, and he was an adversary of Thomas More's. And after the execution of Thomas More's, he was hopeful that he could help to lead the English Reformation in a much more Protestant turn. He was working kind of... Uh, his own agenda, if you will, with the king, who remained very Catholic in his faith and um, really had sought reformation to thwart the power of the Pope. Now, King Henry VIII was not like his father in a lot of ways, and one of the very important ways he was not like his father is that he spent a lot of money and he liked to go to war and he spent a lot of his money on wars. And um, these wars didn't really gain him anything. Most of them were with the French. Most of them were rather short-lived. But King Henry VIII, through his wars and building palaces and other things like that, found himself in constant need of funds. And so Thomas Cromwell suggested as a way for Henry VIII to secure funds and for uh, Cromwell's own purposes as a way to lessen the power of the Catholic Church. He suggested to the king closing all the monasteries in England. Monasteries went back to the early Middle Ages and they were the homes of monks and priests and many of them were located outside of cities and small villages and towns and there were literally uh, hundreds and thousands of them across Europe. And the monasteries served a very important role, not only in the life of the Catholic Church, but in the life of the community in which they were located. Monks had uh, adopted the Benedictine rule to live an ordered life of prayer, of work, and of study. And so the monasteries were often working farms, they kept livestock, they were places of education, monasteries served as a place of rest for travelers, many monasteries might take in the sick and provided other services like that. However, monasteries typically existed on many, many acres of land, very valuable land, very fertile land, and over the years of their existence, and by this time, the 1500s, we're talking about 800, 700 years, long time, many of them had accumulated a great deal of material wealth. So while individual monks weren't wealthy, the monasteries themselves might be in possession of articles of, uh, of wealth, you know, everything from furniture to gold or silver, uh, candlesticks, pieces of art, things of that nature, and most importantly, land. Very, very valuable land, which if the king confiscated, he could sell as at a premium to members of his aristocracy. And once it belonged to members of the aristocracy and not the church, it could be duly taxed. So under the uh, advice of Cromwell and seeing the dollar signs, King Henry VIII closed the monasteries now in England. Now, the way that this happened is um, it happened so badly and, and kind of so roughly that it has become known to history as the sacking of the monasteries. When a city, when a place is sacked, right, it is, it is torn apart by the enemy. It is robbed down to the bone. It is stripped clean. And so we see in this drawing... Uh, a member of the king's guard, he has come to the monastery, he has an order for it to close. The monks are coming out, you can see the look of disgust on the, uh, on the first monk's face. But look down at the bottom, all these material objects, all of these objects of wealth, and you have a very sad young man who is carrying things out. 
the sacking of the monasteries as it came to be known, not just the closing of the monasteries, brought a great deal of wealth to the king. He took that land, he turned around and sold it to his nobility because a lot of this land was some of the finest land in England. And um, then he got to tax it and he also confiscated all the material possessions of these monasteries. And the monks, the monks essentially were turned out. So this fulfilled the goal of Cromwell in blunting a powerful symbol of the church, closing down a powerful symbol of the church, and it served the goal of the king in uh, filling up his treasury. The closing of the monasteries did not go over well with the populace of England. Um, if you were a regular person living in England during all of this drama and hullabaloo, your life probably didn't change all that much. And, and that's a big deal, okay, because this was a political reformation, all right? And so regular people didn't feel themselves affected all that much in their day-to-day -day life. Now, if you were in the aristocracy, there were varying levels of support and lack of support. There was still a strong element of loyalty to Catholicism amongst the English aristocracy. There was just as much, though, um, desire, especially among the gentry class in England, to go with Protestant type reforms. But for regular people, for the most part, they were just kind of going about their daily lives. But the closing of the monasteries changed things. The monasteries served an important role in the life of villages and towns. They were places of education. They were places of care for the sick. They were places that were important sources of food, um, basic necessities in life, bread. Uh, they were brewers and they were important sources of wool and, and beer and all kinds of things. And so the closing of the monasteries prompted the one large scale response, revolt, uprising, if you want to call it, to the Reformation in England. And this is called the Pilgrimage of Grace. And you can see here a banner that was a symbol of the pilgrims. Now, the Pilgrimage of Grace originated in the far north of England under the uh, care of or the supervision of um, a very, very high-ranking member of the British aristocracy. And this started as a, a counter-reformation in England, a demonstration of some of the regular people in the aristocracy, their desire to go back to uh, ca the Catholic Church. And most particularly, the Pilgrimage of Grace asserted um, a desire to speak to the king. That was the stated intention of the pilgrims. They call this a pilgrimage because they marched south. They started in the far north, of England close to Scotland and they marched south and they drew members and other pilgrims with them and they said we are going to talk to the king we are going to ask the king to give us back the monasteries and of course it wasn't and while it wasn't a large part just about the monasteries it was also about uh, a return to um, the Catholic Church proper and and things like that but it was a nonviolent movement for the most part with the pilgrims stating that they only wanted an audience with the king that was their demand they wanted to talk to the king they didn't have any intention of armed uprising etc well by the time the pilgrims arrived outside of london their numbers were literally in the thousands and the king knew that they were coming and like in a lot of things he was really upset about this and he was unsure about what to do and he was getting conflicting advice from some of his advisors. Cromwell was kind of in a weird place with this when, um, with all of this, because he didn't want to look like a bad guy, but he also didn't want to give the pilgrims too much uh, access to the king. He didn't want to stir his sympathy for them. And at a practical matter, the monasteries had been closed. The land had been taken. The money was spent. You know, what were you going to do? about all of this and so eventually the king became very frustrated with these people he saw them as a threat to himself as his authority and he sent um one of his closest friends out to meet him under the guise of being a liaison to the king but the the members of the pilgrimage were 
slaughtered. There was a massacre. The leaders of the pilgrimage were brought to London. They were publicly tortured and executed. And the pilgrimage was over and the resistance was over. And so the Reformation looked stronger than ever in England. In the meantime, um, Thomas Cromwell pushed the king to more clearly define Anglican doctrine. He hoped to have some kind of statement on the beliefs of the Anglican church, how it was different from Catholicism, because again, in liturgy and practice, and in many ways, it remained very, very similar to the Catholic church. And what was happening in England was because of kind of the confusion, just of the act of supremacy and stuff, uh, all different kinds of people were going in all different kinds of ways. And King Henry VIII really saw the need to um, pursue a uniform religious policy. He wanted everyone in England doing the same thing as policy of religious uniformity in his country. And so he assembled a group of clergymen and most of them had started their life as Catholic clergymen. There's varying degrees of um, uh, inclination towards Protestants among them to create what he called the Articles of Faith, which would be the standard doctrine and practice of the Anglican Church. And when they completed their work and presented the articles to the king, he was very pleased and Thomas Cromwell was not because what he got in the articles was a church that looked a whole lot like Catholicism, just minus a pope. And this was really devastating to Thomas Cromwell, who was uh, really starting to see himself in, in, in danger in his beliefs, contrasting so much with the king. But this established in the Church of England a doctrine that was very similar to Catholic doctrine, um, with a, a call for salvation through faith and good works, with seven sacraments, including transubstantiation of the Eucharist, the intercession of the saints, the celibate clergy, you name it. Only main and primary difference was the head of the church in England being the king. Henry VIII soon tired of Anne Bowen, and after she missed carried a baby boy, um, the body of which was badly deformed. Uh, he had her executed on trumped up charges of adultery and incest. The very next day, he married a woman named Lady Jane Seymour. Lady Jane Seymour became his favorite wife. She gave birth not long after their marriage to the long awaited son, Prince Edward. Um, however, Lady Jane Seymour died in childbirth, and this plunged the king into quite a melancholy, uh, and um, so she died soon. She died soon after, but the king had his little prince. Here's a portrait of King Henry VIII and his family. Um, by the time Lady Jane Seymour died, Henry VIII was easily in, in late middle, uh, may, the late middle phase of his life. He was getting older. He was suffering lots of pain and issues from his athletic jaunts, uh, the athletic jaunts of his youth, not unlike a lot of older men do today. Um, he married two more, uh, three more times after Lady Jane Seymour. Um, the fourth, his fourth and fifth marriages were very unsuccessful. His last one was a little bit more successful. His final wife was a woman named Catherine Parr, a member of the British nobility. This is her over here to the left in this very famous portrait of King Henry VIII and his family. Catherine Parr was strongly Protestant in her own religious inclinations. And she didn't really push this too much with Henry VIII, but what she did for him that proved very influential in the long run is she persuaded him to bring his daughters back to court. As a consequence of his marital issues, both the Princess Mary and the Princess Elizabeth had been raised away from him and away from his court, even though they were recognized as legitimate children. Um, it was really, really without question that they were kind of on the outs. And so uh, Catherine Parr convinced 
Henry to bring his daughters back to court and to treat them as more his real and legitimate children. It's a very nice thing that she did for them. But look at this painting. You learn so much from it. So here's Catherine Parr. She's, she's outside. This lady over here is the Princess Mary, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. She is also outside the family, um, if you will. Okay, the king's marriage to her mother had been annulled. Therefore, she was no longer really considered legitimate offspring because the act of secession had specifically named the children of Anne Boleyn, who, so we had Elizabeth here, and look, she's closer to the king for a reason. This is a very telling painting. It's kind of a literal interpretation of how the man understood his family and how uh, the people of England did as well. And then, of course, the young Prince Edward. Henry died when Prince Edward was only nine, and he had become quite ill. It wasn't a surprise or a secret that he would be soon to his deathbed. And um, in this painting, he is talking to the young prince who will take over for him, and he is wanting to solidify the Reformation. He's wanting to solidify the role of the king as the head of the church. And so one of his final acts as king is to work through parliament. And we see in this painting members of his council and others. The final act of his uh, monarchy, which was an, just an additional suppression of the pope, an additional act of the king, an act of parliament, um, suppressing the role of the pope in the Church of England. And once again, restating that the king, this time in the person of Edward, was the head of the church and so we have in this painting henry on his deathbed the young prince edward sitting next to him very much on the throne replication of the throne and then look down here he is sitting upon literally the head of the pope so this painting is kind of literally commemorating uh, what happened here that the reassertion of uh, the power of the Pope, uh, the power of the King over all matters in the Church of England and the suppression of the power of the Pope. But as we, and King Henry VIII died not long after this painting was made, but as we shall see, it wasn't until after King Henry VIII died that things really got interesting um, with religion in England.